Okay, everybody, I have hit the recording button and we're good to go here. Hope everybody's doing well and ready for uh, our second assignment. So just to let you know, I have to let you know before every lesson, this assignment according to my calendar is set for Monday, the 18th of July. Okay, Monday, the 18th of July. That's when this is uh, scheduled for. Hopefully you found the first week's information, you know, a little bit exciting, something you want to learn about. And hopefully we stay in the similar vein, as they say, this week. Okay. All right. So let me go through my usual procedures here. Share the screen. Go to the material. All right. Minimize myself. See ya. I bring that down. Slideshow from the beginning. All right. But not baby, there we go. ANT 101, Introduction to Anthropology. Okay. What you see down there, what week it is. Okay. Where'd my arrow go? Cool. All right. And then we're going to learn some. Uh, we're going to expand from last week, learning about the original learnings of culture being wrapped up in peoples, different peoples, whether they're Indians, Europeans, Asians, what have you. And now we're going to really smack into the culture aspect of this and how this got uh, started. Okay. All right. So it says the rise of... Uh, the culture concept, again, it's a, it's a concept that had to come forth. It was not, you remember, it's one of those key questions. Culture was not the first preoccupation for anthropologists. Right? Talking more about artifacts and things like that. Okay. Its very name declares that the central concern of cultural anthropology is culture. So for cultural anthropology, Culture is the number one. And I promise you'll see that again in a question somewhere. Yet, as seen in the previous chapter, culture was not the original preoccupation, which means worry of anthropology. Anthropologists hardly spoke the language of culture until the mid or late 1800s. So that was a number of a couple hundred years there, you know? I mean, you look like, what was it that used to teach us as a kid in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So, you know, 320 years, 30 years, depending when it started in the 1800s. The first notions of, hey, let's talk about culture and get away from body dimensions. And culture only became the preeminent or number one concept and only in American cultural anthropology in the 1900s. So add another 100 years there. Hmm. Slow to uh, take hold. Culture is obviously a word from ordinary English which tended to mean one of two things until the 19th century. It was either limited to sophisticated elite behavior and taste, right? And I remember that term, it usually came from England though, to be cultured, to have grace and etiquette. Etiquette is, um, I know my Korean, students use this word and it's not right but they say oh we do this because it's etiquette in korea right and to appreciate opera and symphony so that so i'll give you the traditional thing you'd meet people from a while back say when i was a kid from england and they would ask you know someone like my father who Besides working 40 hours a week in a factory, you know, his tastes tend to 
be towards uh, college football on Saturday and Sunday was professional football. So you might have a British person come over and say, do you go to the opera? Do you go to the symphony? Do you watch ballet? And my father would say, hell no, right? And they would say, not too cultured of a person, are you? So Americans have never as a whole been considered high on culture, but that was the old meaning, you know, to be sophisticated. You know, French people also were supposed to be very high culture. Okay, or was a single inclusive trait of the entire human species. This is the other definition that we had. Uh, sometimes written or conceived as culture with a capital C. Human history being the tale of changes and progression of this universal human culture. That's what they're trying to find in cultural anthropology. So this other, if I can expound on this other part, it, it's, it's hard not to go into stereotypes on these. You have to be very careful. People say, well, Chinese people do this, you know, and, uh, French people do that or whatever. So before they were kind of a, a strength, now people look for anything to be upset about. So like I said, you have to be careful without these going into stereotypes or uh, offending people. Right. Okay, in the middle here, both the anthropology, anthropological natural science of man and the history of social institutions, which we covered a little bit last quarter or last chapter, largely proceeded without reference to culture in the modern sense, what we think about in the modern sense as a discrete local system of behavior and taste as cultures in the plural, and that every culture might uh, think and act in different ways and how they express themselves. The origin or beginning of this sense of culture is sometimes attributed to Johann Herder, a German romanticist and nationalist, now, see, here's something too, like this nationalist, um, up until now, it never had a negative uh, connotation or meaning stamp to it. You know, if someone said, I'm a nationalist and I'm, I'm from Germany and I really love Germany, or I'm from Mexico and I really love Mexico or Thailand, you, you just say, okay. Cool, I'm glad you really like your country. But now, uh, since we have this division in the United States now, people on the left, if an American guy says, well, I'm an ex-soldier and I'm a nationalist and I really love America, the people on the left say, well, well, you sound like you, you know, you're, you, you, you might support Trump or you want to kick people out who are not white. Well, if the guy's black, what are you gonna say then, right? So even this has changed, this nationalist thing, at least in the States now, it's being a little negative, but it, it had always been positive until that time. So of the 18th century, who believed that humanity as a whole was on a mission of progress, this is what Johann Herder felt, but that the actors in this great story were neither the species, so species is, you know, different species, uh, different types of animals, nor the individual, but an intermediate level, the nation. So that we go back to what is this cultural thing of nationalism? <clears throat> each nation, each people was a unit, a national organism. That's a unique way of looking at that. That's why I got this book, has some unique things to say. I don't agree with all of them, but it should be studied. So this national organism with its special gift and its special genius, yeah, again, those are terms are hard to define. Don't worry about that. What she called is national geist. This is German. You're not going to have to remember that. 
which means national spirit or sildes box, soul of the people or people, geistes box, spirit of the folk slash people. In other words, every nation or people possess its own unique national cu culture. And that is correct. You know, like I said prior, there was nothing negative about it, you know. Accordingly, each distinct nation or people should be known and celebrated for its characteristic achievements, which could be found in its literature or its music or its art or its religion. The details depended on the particular nation the soul or spirit of a people that is, was located in its folklore, which was the shared heritage and treasure of the group. Okay, so if you're a little misty on folklore, okay, I'll, I'll give you some examples. I know I have a lot of uh, Korean students. So, uh, when I started teaching in Koreatown many, many years ago, um, uh, it was still popular for a lot of Korean people to talk about these stories that they grew up being read to by their parents about tigers, right? All kinds of different tiger stories. Uh, I remember one about a tiger that came to the house of an old harmony and wanted to eat her, and, but she tricked him and eventually threw some hot ash in his eyes and then he jumped over a cliff and died. And the harmony, um, she outsmarted, you know, the grandmother outsmarted the tiger. So these kinds of stories um, are folklore. And most of the people in the country have heard them, shared them, and they give a certain feeling you know, same in Mexico with stories about La Llorona or, you know, different things from Day of the Dead, you name it. Uh, so these are folklore stories and each country has uh, their own. Uh, and, uh, another one was very funny that someone asked me, who's the first Korean people? I said, I'm not sure. I, I guess there were Korean, the Asian, obviously, and he said, no, the first Korean was a bear. We're taught that the first Korean was a bear. Oh, okay, so these are folklore type stories. Okay. Even 19th century psychologists like Wilhelm Wundt, who helped establish scientific psychology, emphasized that there was a level between individual psychology, you, your own personal psychology, and species psychology of your species, a folk psychology or psychology of the people, which they called, uh oh, you're, like I said, if I can't say this, you, you don't have to worry about it. Volker psychology. Uh, for somebody that speaks German, uh, don't get upset with me. The folk or national mind or personality could and should be studied through ethnology, archaeology, and history, which meant the collection and analysis of cultural materials. And again, this is where your folklore stuff is located songs, stories, traditional clothing artifacts and such. I mean, there's even more, you know, jewelry, but is that part of clothing? You know, ETC musical instruments, well, that's that part of song. So there's a much longer list. All of this mental and material folklore was the expression and embodiment or meaning soul of the folk personality and the national culture, you know? Um, and it stayed for a while. Some interesting things that I, I noticed, right, that these kind of grow and sometimes fade, but 
I know for, let's say, you younger folks, uh, Japanese, you know, you'll say, hey, you know, the only people that wear, let's say, a kimono are geisha. And then if it's a girl's 20th birthday or a wedding, that's it. You don't see Japanese women walking, the, regular women walking the street in kimonos. If you can go to YouTube and look at videos from the late 60s and early 70s, a lot of Japanese women were still wearing kimonos. And they were not geisha. It was not their birthday. They were not getting married. So over time, national costumes, and it was the same for, for Korea. You know, a lot of ladies wore hanbok. And I don't know the name of the old white outfit, but eventually people want to be modern, modern, modern. That's why I wonder sometimes if Western culture, or Western clothes were not adopted by most of the world. Everybody wants to wear blue jeans and these fashions, you know, Gucci, who knows, right? But instead, the world adopted traditional Chinese clothes. You know, that would have been very interesting, right? But it just so happened. Uh, the world wanted to wear Western clothes. So uh, traditional outfits uh, tend to be worn very rarely, you know, unless maybe you live in the countryside. Oh, but if you look at North Korea, uh, most of the women wear hanboks in North Korea. Uh, you find out why. Is that what Kim Jong-un likes? I, his parents? I don't know. Interesting. Again, culture. In the late 1800s, in early 1900s, scholars began to ask where and how culture first appeared and how it spread. That's a very interesting question. Actually, two-parter. Two dominant and competing notions or ideas were diffusionism and evolutionism. Evolutionism, you, start, you should start thinking about, you know who, right? The famous Darwin. Okay, Diffusionism held that human culture, here, meaning in this book, probably best viewed as culture, had only been invented once or at most a few times. Interesting statement. Further, based on the similarities between cultures in the same vicinity, so countries being close to each other, but have similar uh, types of clothing or songs. Thinkers like the geographer Frederick Ratzel or the ethnologist Fritz Grabner, and I don't know who he grabbed though, and Wilhelm Schmidt expounded or further studied the idea of a small number of culture circles, Kulturkreise in German, which culture radiated or grew out to neighboring groups. At its most extreme, as in the work of British anat anatomist, study of the body, G. Eliot Smith, all culture was theorized or thought to have had emanated or grown out from a single source and in his view, ancient Egypt. I got to be careful with these things. A lot of these anthropologists have their own view. And I, I don't care how strong they are, just realize that uh, somebody else might hold an equally as strong view. Uh, now, look, for the last, uh, just in regular anthropology, well, there might be a mix of cultural. Um, for the last maybe 15 years, 20 years, they have stated, you know, man. The first man came from Africa, okay? But when I was a kid, all the books and everything that they stated, it was very strongly held that man came from China, right? So who's to say in another 10 years, we find another archeological discovery and man comes from India, you know? Who's to say? So, you know, as strong as these people feel, there's always something that changes the script. In either case, diffusionism suggested the notion of culture areas that shared historical cultural connections. 
evolutionism, again, aka Darwin. On the other hand, organized culture is not spatially, right, like out in circles, but chronologically, step by step in order, claiming that culture, again, probably culture here, changed and progressed over time. So interesting things to think about, yes? Okay. All right. Although usually considered an evolutionist, the classic anthropological definition of culture was given by E.B. Tyler. I don't know what the initial stood for, Ernest. Ernest Benjamin, I don't know, it's not important. So E.B. Tylor in his discipline shaping 1871 book, Primitive Culture. Primitive meaning like, almost like caveman style, right? In an utterance, so utterance is if to utter something means to say something some old English here. So in saying something familiar to all cultural anthropologists today, Tyler defined culture as that complex whole, like a whole pie, right? Which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. So uh, look at that pie, not like it's a big pumpkin pie, but it's a big pie that has a slice of pumpkin, has a slice of uh, blueberry, has a slice of apple, you know, you name it. That's why you have these uh, various entities here, belief, knowledge, art, morals, all these things make up the society. Cultural anthropologists do not take this as a, the authoritative definition of culture. So as you can see here, right? So our current cultural anthropologist, this is do not take this as the authoritative definition of culture. So they don't believe that to be the 100% definition. And then what do they proceed here? This is where it gets sticky. And indeed, there is no single authoritative definition. So they're kind of blowing left and right themselves. They're not saying this is the exact definition of cultural, cultural anthropology. They're saying eh, there's a lot in here that's correct, but you know, it's not the final stamp, so to speak. And this is, although Tyler hit up, see, although Tyler hit upon most of the key characteristics of the current concept, it, it, it's funny, it kind of reminds me of, I don't know why, but uh, like, a, <laughs> like a guy um, trying to marry a girl, you know, and he's trying to meet her list of demands, right? I have a new car now, I have a condo, you know, I got a raise at my job, whatever, and hoping she says, okay, I think I have a future with you. And she's like the present day culture anthropologist. She says, you know, you got a lot of good things there, but you don't have exactly all that I need. Sorry, right? There's still more. And I'm not sure what they are, right? That's what that reminds me of, okay? Now we'll go into the contemporary culture concept. Right, concept, and be careful, sometimes concepts can change or found to be erroneous. So continuing, rather than settling on a formal final definition, so rather than looking for or accepting a final definition, most cultural anthropologists operate with a sense of culture's key characteristics or features. 
And typically cultural anthropologists say that, and now we're gonna go through a series of things that they, that they say, these are their statements. One, culture is learned. So this is something they believe. Culture is not innate, which means you're not born with it or inherited genetically, okay? Now, again, as I just talked to you guys on how to look at things, I might disagree with that. And you might ask me how, okay? Okay, so they're saying more like, let's say, you can be born Chinese and yet, let's say you're adopted and not raised by Chinese parents. And so that being said, you won't inherit any part of the culture of being Chinese, all right? And uh, where obviously I would say, okay, they didn't learn how to read or write Chinese, they learned how to speak Chinese, so they should, as it says, you can't inherit anything genetically, but I bet you a hundred dollars uh, that kid, even though raised in America and doesn't speak any Chinese, I would bet you that genetically this person will manifest an Asian squat without being taught one from his family, right? Uh, that's, that's my feeling. That you'll that person will start just sitting in that manner, and both of the say the parents are Caucasian, they don't do that or or can't do that. Like if I try to do that, I think both my knees would explode and I couldn't get up, right? But throughout the Asian diaspora, Asian people very easily do an uh, uh, Asian squat, and that's inherited genetically. So again, just look at these things for what they are. Okay, but they feel it is acquired from experience with other usually older members of society. So at that point, they'd say, well, the Chinese person has to see other people doing it and then they'll mimic it, right? I tend to disagree on that, they'll do it naturally because it's been around since the beginning of time. Uh, culture anthropologists call the process of acquiring culture enculturation which is synonymous or same meaning with socialization, the preferred term of psych sociology. So I guess they don't like the term enculturation. I don't find anything wrong with it, but to each his own. Hardly a simple matter of imitation. So it means it's not just imitation. Culturation is the active mastering of social knowledge and skill through observing other people, right? So I would put forward the same thing, okay? I would, I'm very curious. I would put forward the same thing. And I'll give you another example from another culture. Uh, Italian people are famous for when they speak, they talk with their hands, okay? They talk with their hands. So I'm curious. Have there been any Italian babies that were adopted by couples that were not Italian? And of course, they're not going to be showing him how to speak with their hands, you know. And I wonder if any of the kids just naturally, as they spoke English, also moved their hands around. I'm very curious about that. If that's something that's been going on for millennia for that culture, okay? Something to look into. Three, culture is shared. Culture is not a trait of the individual, but of the group, specifically the society. We could say that a group society has or does a culture, or that a culture is the quality or possession of a group society. However, 
we must also guard against the simplistic notion. Okay, so it's protect yourself from these simple thinking notions. Uh, B, what people do in one society is totally different and separate from what people do in another. There are variations within any society. You have subcultures, counterculture, regional cultures, and cultural differences based on age, gender, class, race, etc. It is more accurate to say that culture is transmitted and distributed within a group. So these variations, like you might have subcultures, there was a move a while back, uh, young people were doing the Gothic thing and then countercultures, you know, people coming out with other uh, vampirisms or who knows what, right? And then you have regional cultures and cultural difference. So regional cultures, again, if we go back to Korea, oh, I forget where she was from. But there was a Korean lady I, I used to teach and she told me this little sad story about her marriage. She married a Korean man from uh, Seoul. Just to let you know, this was a while back. So uh, Omoni mother-in-law had a lot of power. So I trying to remember where she was from, but maybe it was from a country area, but it was not from anywhere near Seoul. So at the wedding party, she was supposed to make uh, side dishes or banchan. And he's expecting the traditional Korean way where you have many small white dishes. But where she came from, they, they had a, a, some kind of special large dish with different compartments and you put them all in that big dish. And that upset his mother because that was not Seoul style, was not the traditional style. So that is a regional style. Uh, and it can be a cultural difference, right? Yes, it can. Uh, we have one verbally. Um, if someone says the word herb, I know they're from the East Coast. Okay. And if you say herb, pronounce the word herb, H-E-R-B, you're from the West Coast. And I've never heard anybody tell somebody, well, you're saying it wrong because we say it like, it just says, oh, okay, I know where you're from. That's the way it is. But again, you can have different types of uh, cultural differences. Now four, culture is symbolic. What's the symbol here? While cultural anthropologists have become a bit leery, which means a bit afraid of the strong linguistic or language or textual analogy, maybe written material of past decades, culture can still be usefully understood as a system of symbols and meanings akin or related to a language. Humans never live directly in an unmediated world, which means not observed or directed. Humans create meanings, store those meanings in words or gestures or objects, and then exchange these meaningful things with each other in a grand symbolic conversation. Of course, this entails that the same sound or gesture or object may have an, have an entirely different meaning or no meaning at all in some other society. And again, when you talk about gestures, um, here we have the thing where you take your thumb and your uh, forefinger and you make a circle, right? And your other three fingers stand up straight and you put that in front of your face and that means A-okay. Everything's okay. Are you sick? And you go, I'm okay. All right. I had a friend that went to Russia one time to Moscow and he met some guy and he flashed him the okay. And the guy got pissed off and tried to hit him because in Russia, that means you're an asshole. So uh, they can have, 
different meanings, right? Next, seven. Culture is integrated. Integrated means bringing different components together as one and make them integrated. As Tyler, remember all, what was it, FB? Stated, culture is a complex whole. It's that pie again with different pie fillings composed of many parts in active and functional interconnection. This does not mean necessarily that every part of culture works well or that the integration is tight or really firm together. Yeah, yeah, it might be loose, it might kind of work sometimes. It does mean that we must investigate each part, each behavior, value, institution in relation to others and that alterations to one part will almost certainly induce or make changes in other areas. Cultural anthropologists typically envision or look at culture as comprised of four major functional domains. Domains are areas or institutions, economics, Kinship, kinship means family. You, if you ever meet somebody from the country or from the mountains, they're gonna say, are you my kin? And that means, are you my family, right? Politics and religion. And of course, each of these domains or areas contains many specific subsystems, even smaller systems. Culture is adaptive. So again, people in, in different species adapt to weather, and, uh, economic situations like right now. How are we going to adapt to this rising inflation and the endless uh, over six something dollars of gas and the groceries and you know rent? How are we going to adapt to that? Human bodies and brains do not compel or force us to live in any particular way, quite the opposite. Human behavior is at most likely governed by genetic and physiological factors. Hence, so our rejection of the biological racial determinism of early anthropology. Instead, human behavior is incredibly flexible and we are relatively free to invent, learn, and share new behaviors in order to adapt to the environment. Both the natural environment and what social scientists call the built environment, that is the environment that we ourselves have put into place like big cities, including cities and streets and farms and canals. Culture is how humans adapt themselves to the environment. And it is how they adapt the environment to themselves, which is why many geographers practice a form of cultural geography or human geography. Interesting stuff. Okay. Now we'll get into the um, production and circulation of culture. For a long time, cultural anthropologists operated or seemed to operate with the assumption, remember an assumption is a guess, okay, that each discrete or individual society possessed a discrete culture. In other words, we could associate one people in one place with one culture. If we really ever did hold this view, it was demolished or destroyed by an Edmund Leach in its 1954 political systems of Highland Burma. 
Burma is now known as Myanmar. Mentioned in the previous chapter, which demonstrated the relations and even permeability of different cultures. Since that time, and especially of late with the increasing awareness of globalization, cultural anthropologists have come to understand and stress the circulation of culture and the flow of culture across social boundaries. Neither ideas, nor objects, nor people themselves remain in one place. Rather, culture is today mobile, means it can move. Easily traveling between societies and around the world in the form of television and movies and music and on social media, YouTube, and products like blue jeans, and of course, information networks like the internet and social media. Again, I remember being a kid and most countries around the world could, did not and could not get blue jeans. And they wanted blue jeans just like Americans had, you know, Levi's, Europe too. So they developed these illegal markets or black markets and they would sell these sometimes not the best quality blue jeans, but there was a market for it, right? You don't have to do that now. But uh, yeah, so that's something else too. They could not get uh, blue jeans. When I first encountered indigenous people, specifically the Walpiti of Australia. I expected, and he said subconsciously wanted, them to be living in a primordial traditional. So I, I'm not sure exactly which tribe are the Walpiti, but it's like when people talk about Aborigines, every time you see them, they're almost completely naked and then living you know, by Ayers Rock in the hot desert and chanting and things like that. So. I guess these people are, are a relation of them. So that's what he thought when he first went there. And that's what he was looking for. And then he gets there and he finds out these folks are driving cars, playing guitars, not didgeridoos, watching television. And they had just recently begun making their own television programs. You can see Walpiti television and hear Walpiti music at the Walpedia Media Association. And most societies today have their own radio stations, websites, film production companies, Facebook pages, and the like. All right. So uh, as far as me and my own travels, I would have to say the most remote people that I met and still seem to live a traditional old lifestyle are the long neck women in Thailand. So uh, I, don't, I don't remember if I was in Bangkok or Chiang Mai and then I took a special bus and then got off in a foresty or jungle area and then the tour guide had to take me through a secret back way that if she left me there, I, I would have, I'd still be living in the jungle in Thailand. And then she opened a secret area and I met the uh, long neck ladies. And uh, there was no TV. I think I heard a radio in the back of somebody might've had a radio. Uh, there's no shopping mall. So I watched the kids. And I'm like, okay, how are these kids playing? Are they playing with Power Rangers? They don't seem to have little, you know, phones that they can watch, you know, Pokemon on. What are they doing? And I watched this one boy and he had a stick and he was putting a stick in the side of the mountain. They live kind of like on the side of a mountain looking for snakes. And then a little girl walked up to me 
opened her hand and a little bird flew out of her hand. But she had the foot tied to a string, which was tied to her middle finger and pulled the book back, uh, the bird back. So as far as my travels, I, I don't know if they've upgraded that since then. That was maybe 20 years ago, 18 years ago. But that was pretty remote. And as you can see, these people here, while well, PD, they were living a modern way. All right, so participant observation means that the researcher must first go in person. Again, you're participating to the society he or she wants to study and spend a long time, ordinarily a year or more, making on site observations. Second, though, the researcher cannot merely watch from a veranda or balcony. The anthropologist must live among and as far as possible live like the people he or she studies. This means all above else learning the local language. Then it means doing the work, eating the food. That's another funny thing when I went up there, like I said, the long neck ladies, the men don't do that. The men think women look beautiful that way. But uh, as I walked around, I didn't see any men. I know these women had husbands. So I asked my tour guide, I said, where are the men? And she said, oh, the men are lazy. They already drank beer and they're sleeping in the afternoon. The women do most of the work. So I'm like, hmm, that sounds like a universal culture that does not have to be specifically learned. Just that men are going to be drinking beer and going to sleep in the afternoon. I wonder. So there you go. So again, this means above all else, learning the local language, doing the same work they do, eating the food and wearing clothes that they wear. And in other ways, joining in the local life. That's how you can really study these folks, not from afar, living in your, uh, you know, air conditioned Winnebago and eating your shipped in food. You gotta live the life, baby. Cultural anthropologists may well conduct or do interviews, explore archives, and collect quantitative, you know, a lot of that data information. But participant observation is the flagship method or central number one of the discipline and has become a virtual rite of passage for students who want to enter the profession. So a rite of passage means you have to do or go through something to be accepted into the profession where people say, yes, you know, you are a cultural anthropologist. So you have to do these things so that you can be accepted. I can give you some examples on, you know, things that are really obvious, but you can see, so uh, in football, professional football, you know, you can get out there and play your first game and play your season, but most will say you have not really earned your spot as a professional football player until somebody hits you so hard that you're knocked out. Then they say, welcome to the NFL. Right. They go, now you know the feeling that everybody else has. You know, it's not all just touchdowns and, you know, running away from folks. And then on another level, let's say you want to be a stand up comedian. Uh, you know, let's, let's say the first couple of nights you do it, everybody loves your jokes and everything's fine and dandy. And you're like, this is the easiest thing that I've ever seen. And I'm going to get paid for this. I love it. But just wait until you bomb, wait until people boo you, want you off the stage, yell at you, throw food at you. When that happens, then the other comics who have been around for years will say, welcome to the life of a stand-up comedian. Now you've earned your right for the profession because you've also suffered like the rest of us. So that's what a rite of passage means, okay? 
So ending again, in this way, anthropological research is essentially an apprenticeship in another culture. So apprenticeship is like, these have apprenticeships for jobs, trade jobs. You study under a professional for a year and you're like the apprentice or the student that he will tell you when you're ready to start to work on your own, okay? So participant observation is not easy. No, it isn't. It is a substantial commitment of time and of one's life. Imagine a whole year and, uh, you know, let's say you live with a remote family someplace and they have to be around in the mud a lot and that's where their pigs are. They don't have uh, running electricity. You have to, you know, bathe in the lake, but be careful of the frogs and possible snakes. That's why it's not easy and it can't be dangerous. The locals may be uncooperative or suspicious. That's another thing. You have to gain their trust. They might not like you. It's, who's a strange person with a big, some shiny watch and then a big iPhone and jewelry, bling, bling. And they're like, who is this guy? Okay. But it is the only way to know another person's culture and epistemology. So you don't have to worry about that word. Further, because ideas and objects and people circulate, they go around in a circle. Anthropologists can no longer expect to sit in one village and learn everything there is to know about people. So again, when I went up to the long neck people, which is really just the women, there was a close village of long eared women who the more silver they wore as earrings, the more richness that they felt. So the ears tended to grow very long, but silver was very heavy. So I'm sure they shared things culturally too. Anthropologists must flow with the culture and society. Perhaps traveling between villages, right? Or even cities doing what we call multi, meaning many, sided location research. In short, culture anthropology has changed as the world we investigate has changed. Okay, and then this is the last part of the reading. Cultural anthropologists need not study in a physical place at all. Hmm. Listen to this. Cultural happens wherever human beings interact with each other, including online and virtual communities. This is now the present day and future places where culture takes place. Some very insightful research has therefore been done recently on virtual places like Second Life and World of Warcraft, okay? So that's beginning in the present and headed for the future, okay? So maybe you can get that gig and you don't have to go live in the mountain or work in the mud or wash in the river with a snake coiling around your leg and frogs jumping on you, right? That might be more to your liking, okay? On to the questions, okay? All right, my first question is, what is the central concern of cultural anthropology? That's in the very first part of the reading. If you miss that, I do not know what to tell you. So obvious, it'll smack you in the face. Okay, two, where was the soul or spirit of a people located? So we talked about that in German and English. So where is the solar spirit located? It's a one word answer. Okay, I didn't say that. All right, three, what did Diffusionism hold? Again, for the new folks who say, what does he mean? I'm confused. Does Diffusionism hold anything like a bottle of whiskey? What, what is he talking about here? I put hold because they use the verb to hold and it says held, right? So I use that so you can find the answer about diffusionism, right? Say, oh, it held, hold, oh, I got it. If I just changed it and said, what did diffusionism think? 
maybe you might not find the answer is easy. So I'm trying to make it easy on you folks, that's why. So don't think that's not possible, teacher. Your grammar is incorrect. A box, well, no, a shoe cannot hold anything, right? Now just look for where it says held. Fine. Four, how did evolutionism organize cultures? So what they're saying here is how they thought about culture and organization, they thought different. So say how they, it's not a long answer. Say how evolutionism organizes culture. Five, how did E.B. Tyler define culture? Right. What did he say? This was culture, okay? That might be a little bit longer on that one, so. Six, list some characteristics of contemporary culture. Okay, it's a pretty long list. And let me go through what I go through every quarter. Um, the more you put, the more points you'll get, but you do not, like let's say if it's a list of nine things, you don't have to put nine things, you don't have to put eight things, you don't have to put seven. This is just to discourage the person who usually puts one, they ignore the list and they just put one. So, and then you might have a person, ah, okay, I'll put two, which is okay. But if you put uh, four or five, you know, three, four or five, you're gonna get more points. So, yeah, so let me see how much, uh, enthusiasm you have for your participation since we're not meeting in, in, in person, right? And I can't see you answer my questions or hide in the back behind a Big Mac. All right, seven, cultural anthropologists have come to understand and stress what? That answer is in there. Don't say you can't find it. It'll say they've become to understand and stress blah, 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 about blah, blah, blah kind of changing their mindset on something. Okay. Here we go, I read this out loud before. What is the flagship method of cultural anthropology? Does that mean there's a ship and it's got a flag on top of it? Well, I don't know what the flag says, you know? No, it's a cultural way of saying something, meaning the number one way, central way of doing something. Nine, anthropological research is essentially what? Not a long answer, but what define the research? Define the answer for the research and you'll be fine. Okay, and then 10, what is multi-sided research? So you might have to list a couple of things there. In fact, you do, because multi means many, right? So you have to list, if you just say multi-sided research is this one way of doing research, uh, either I'm gonna mark that wrong, you know, if that comes on the test or I'm gonna give you very low points. So again, you see multi, give me a few, you know, at least three, all right, okay. Okay, so it looks like we're done for this uh, July 18th. Okay, so we'll show the rest of this procedure. Stop share. There I am again. Hey, how you doing? So hopefully you've enjoyed the July 18th recording and look forward to the next one, which will be scheduled for July the 25th. So until then, take care and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.